thank, thank you, Bishop Sutton. Thank you uh, to Bencha delegates for your attention. And I'm, I'm going to take you a bit on a journey. Uh, and I want to say up front, it will not necessarily reflect what your experience in your own congregations has been. Uh, I'm a congregational lover. Um, I went to a parish recently and they had my picture and the queen are posted in the same place. Usually I'm under the queen, not always. And someone had put a little piece of paper with a quote that said, just pasted it up on the wall that said, I love parishes. And I thought I have not lived in vain because it's true. I, I am a, uh, I, I, I believe that local communities of faith are where people turn towards or away uh, from, from Jesus, from God, and that we in the Episcopal Church and in the Anglican Church in this day and time have something, a unique identity that is life-giving to people. So I'm, uh, I'm a bit of an evangelist about that. This will be the story of my parish in Seattle, so U.S., not Canada. Um, and the story of, in a sense, accessing some of the questions and skills that became the college. Because when I began in Olympia, I, I, I found out right when I came to St. Paul's that, oops, they couldn't pay me as a full-time salary. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. You go and you move and oops. And, uh, and so I, I took a second gig with the diocese. Uh, and uh, part of it was creating, Greg Rickle was the new bishop, he and I both had uh, an experience of and an interest in substantial training at the, at the diocesan level in congregational development, so that was, I was kind of creating that while developing uh, with others at uh, the parish. Uh, so it might not be the church personship of your parish, this is not Though at the Society of Catholic Priests, I focused on Anglo-Catholic evangelism, or you just might say Catholic evangelism. That's not what this is about. This is about leaders, and particularly me as the new kid on the block, drawing on some skills and questions and models as a way to assist uh, the parish uh, to become an even more beautiful flowering of itself, something that we all believe that God yearned for in this parish at this particular time with us. So uh, that's, of course, at the Easter Vigil and in our entryway. We'll start with the Vigil, we'll end with the Vigil, and uh, that, uh, the, that little candle I'm holding is going to go uh, to light uh, the Paschal candle. So again, just, just as we go through this, listen for the thing that resonates for you if there is a piece related to the approaches or the questions or even to the experience. So some preliminary. So I, I just want to identify, and it, I could have chosen a bunch of other things, but I want to identify just some little things that are going to show up in this presentation. The first is a change formula, and I'm going to come back to that. It's very telegraphic. C equals B times D times F is greater than R. It's not really meant to be like a math thing. It's a way of expressing something important about change, a very telegraphic thing. I'll come back to that. Second, and this is my belief, discernment, and what I have experienced, discernment, communal discernment, and also I'd say discernment in the lives of individuals, flows from engaging in listening processes with the intention of acting based on what you learn. It's right out of Benedict. A Benedictine discernment. You listen in order to act. Benedict calls it obedience. Listening in order to act. Three, and this is from me. No one ever taught me in the many seminaries I went to. I was a bit of a vagabond. What the core purpose of a parish church? What? I never, nobody ever said anything about that. We need a model to work with. And finally, this is a quote from somebody who uh, I trusted, redeveloping a parish, and I'm, I'm using the language of parish because I'm coming from Canada where we still use it, and it's the new cool thing too among evangelical thinkers is the use of that word parish. It actually belongs to us. Redeveloping a parish requires one intervention after another. Doing one thing, and then when things shift, doing another, then another, it never stops. 
you never arrived. You're just intervening in the life of the parish over and over again. So, St. Paul, Seattle, 2004. It sounds so long ago. That, believe it or not, is the roof. That's the roof. It's a vaulting A-frame like, uh, uh, oh gosh, what is the chapel at the Airport. Air Force Academy? It's like that, not quite as beautiful. And that's the Space Needle, of course, in the back. So the parish had gone, to, just, just to kind of ground us and what was going on, when I got there, it had been for a two-year interim in which the parish uh, contracted, to say the least. Average Sunday attendance, two liturgies, an 8 and a 1030, was 89, 20 of whom were in the choir. <laughs> and up in a loft at the back, not within sight line. 20 were in the choir. So it was lonely down there. Operating deficit, and this is what I came to find out, seventy to $90,000 on, on an annual basis, and so could only afford an 80% time rector. Hmm, okay, great. It owed $40,000 in back assessment. Mm -hmm. It drew members from both the neighborhood and the region. So who were they? So uh, liturgy and music was their charism, and when you walked into the space, there was a palpable sense of prayer there. Have you ever been someplace like that? Maybe it's your own parish, maybe it's some. You walk in and it's like you could, you could touch it. In, in fact, it, that was the, the consistent feedback we got from visitors. Deeply introverted. I was the extrovert. <laughs> That's exhausting, actually. Uh, they're well-educated. PhD, oh my gosh. Urban and funky. But you would believe they had never talked to another human being. But for me, lovable. That was important. Uh, we were the only Anglo-Catholic parish in the Diocese of Atlanta. But they did not want to call themselves that for reasons I won't go into. Uh, others call them the gay parish. That's how we were known, the gay parish. And the parish actually didn't like that. They did not want to be a gay and lesbian ghetto. They did not. But we were the gay parish. We make that for me. Uh, all right, so that I kind of understood so how it was perceived. The worship space had powerful bones, but a very odd, incongruent aesthetic. More than I can say. <laughs> Tender-hearted. It was a place in Seattle where it was the only church that would host the funerals of, of gay people who had died from AIDS. Mostly gay men who had died from AIDS. And that process broke the parish's heart. And the way I came to understand that is the broken hearted become the broken open. So there are all kinds of ways we can talk about our history in parishes. All kinds of ways. Some which put us in a corner and, and eliminate the possibility of a future that God has in store for us and some which open it up and blow it open. No kids, but they remembered them. <laughs> we, we did have kids, yeah. Uh, and we loved them, we think. All three of them that we had before. They actually were ready for new energy and growth, but they had no idea how to go about it. And here's what they remembered about the visitations of the bishop. More people would come if they, you, you could be filled to the brim if people really knew about the liturgy and music that's going on. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. And? Should you decide to close, your property will be very valuable. <laughs> now, both of those things were really helpful. Why? Why? Because what did, what did they get in their head about what's their possibility? Growth? And then what did they, what, what kind of feeling did they have about the diocese? <laughs> Just, we are not closing. And I love that. I love it. Don't like parishes closing. I mean, I'm just not about that. I'm, I might be forced to be about that, but it's over my reclining body that that will happen. I told my diet. The neighborhood. There it is. Uh, in the shadow of the space meter. That was the, uh, the greeting I, I left on the phone message. We are St. Paul, Seattle, sitting in the shadow of the space meter. 
um, urban, edgy, within pro close proximity of a kind of gentrified neighborhood at the top of the hill, Queen Anne Hill, urban Mayberry, near the Seattle Center, Seattle School for Psychology and Theology, uh, begun by Brian McLaren and some of his friends. Yes. Remember that. Uh, Seattle Pacific University, free church, uh, free church students looking for a different way to be. South Lake Union, the Gates Foundation moved into the neighborhood, and all the arts venues, and absolutely no parking. <laughs> and of course, a really important piece is many homeless people on the public grounds of the Seattle Center, while at the same time gentrifying. Okay, let's come back first to a bit of theory. This occurs in the, in the college, in the School for Parish Development, and it's just a little way of saying something. It's not the new gospel, it's not the only thing about change, it's just one little snapshot by Richard Beckhardt. Change equals vision times dissatisfaction of the current state times the ability to articulate first steps. When all those are positive numbers, it can overcome the natural human resistance to change. Resistance to change is natural and human. I have it all the time. Change equals some sort of articulated vision times dissatisfaction with the current state. Or you could say, another way of saying that is readiness times the ability to articulate first steps has the potential to overcome the natural human tendency to resist change. All right. And discernment flows from engaging in listening processes with the intention of acting based on what you learn. So here I am, new, 80% time. Still holding, I have a little consulting business, I still do in a way. Um, I, I thought, well, I'll just take on one client. That'll supplement my, my income. So change equals, did St. Paul's have a vision for the future, do you think? Not, not that it necessarily was written down. What do you think your vision was? No, not survive. If more people knew about, so this is where bishops come in and they're handy, right? If more people knew about this place, you would be filled to the brim. Times dissatisfaction. You think they were dissatisfied? Yeah. They're getting ready to go down the tubes. Financially. Times first steps. Big question mark. What are the first steps? All those in the positive realm. If any one of those is zero, this theory says you can't get it. You can't go overcome it. Anything is zero, you can't overcome it. So my sense was, okay, we can do this. So listening, but listening to whom and about what? What do we do to get started? And then finally, no one ever taught me the core purpose of a parish church. We need a model to work with. So models, and you'll see, we have lots of models. We got seven core models in the, in the School for Parish Development, the College for Congregational Development. This is one of them that purports to be uh, the core purpose of a parish church. I created it, and I had some inspiration. That inspiration is what we did this morning. What was it? And what kind? The Holy Eucharist. Gather, transformation sending. Gather, transformation sending. So with models, what you do with models is you use them as, a, as lenses through which to look at your parish, Models aren't real, they're just schematics. And to assess, to, and not just you assess, but a community of people assess in order to look at where are we strong, what do we need to do to improve, and every parish can improve. And yes, it's a collective assessment. It isn't just me thinking about, well, mm, what do I think here? It's convening, uh, listening, kind of like a town meeting, but highly facilitated in which we listen around these core pieces. So let me just say something about the model. Gather. So the idea is that the 
a purpose of the parish church, it's not a, a, a thing on the side, but a purpose of the parish church, is to assist God in the gathering of people into a community of faith that has the potential to be transformative of them so that over time, we are Anglican, of course, over time, more and more we conform to the image of Christ. Another way of saying it is, more and more we live more deeply into our baptismal identity and purpose. And I say both those things intentionally, identity and purpose. In a sense, you could look at our baptismal covenant, we are just as crazy about it in Canada as we are here in the U.S., and think that we are just human doings, you know? Do you promise? I do. God says, I do what God says. But, but baptismal identity is about a way of being in the world that affects things. It's not just the doing, but it's both. So those two words are intentional. So a, a, a community of faith that is has the potential to be, is always working on that, and then sending those same people to be salt, light, and leaven in the world. Individually, most of us, most of our, our folks that are not have vocations in the church are stealth Christians in workplaces, in civic life, where they're not actually wearing the stripe. Now, in the U.S., you wear the stripe more than we do in Canada the Christian, the Baptist, the Episcopal, you know, you just do. In Canada, it's a more secular culture, and that, so, so Christians, Anglican Christians, lay people out in, in civic life and work life, they're stealth. It's actually helpful, <laughs> in some sense. So if you can be sent as individuals, as salt, light, leaven, or collectively, into a neighborhood, as groups, and then we're in whatever context we're in, we're, we, it's a cycle. We are gathered again, process of transformation, sending, and where we're set to helps inform the transformation process. So these are, even though you, you're, I had to use lines when you're looking at it, and it's not very beautiful or sophisticated, I just did this. Um, it, it is, uh, these are not, so, the lines are not so hard. So the parish is part of their core purpose is to assist God in gathering. It's not just, oh, by the way, we should be nice to people. That's part of our core purpose. Gathering can be, and this is really old stuff, there are lots of versions of this. This is Alice Mann's work from the 80s in a little book called The Incorporation of New Members in the Episcopal Church. She's pretty cool. So here's, gathering is inviting. That is, everything you do before anybody comes across the threshold, greeting. What happens when you, the first couple of times when people are there, orienting, how they get more kind of oriented to things like, hmm, I just may stay, and the incorporation being knitted more fully in the community. Again, it's a model. It's not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, but that's gathering. I, I point that out because it's a little sub-segment of this model in that St. Paul's, of course, needed to work on that. So getting started. So. Ah, that's it. Let us pray. <laughs> oh my. If I didn't have a rich prayer life before it, I sure did get one. Or at least I got a persistent one. I got a very persistent one. I thought, I'm going to wear out God <laughs> with my entreaties. Because I believe that either I will be changed by this, or we will be changed by it. And I asked the parish to do it. And of course, prayer was one of their charisms. And we just did it, and did it, and did it, and did it, and did it. Secondly, a full parish listening processes. So these are like tools of engagement. Tools of engagement. And we listened around these things. Gathering, transformation, membership growth, and of course, we had to do it around money. It's hard to be great at transformation process when you're worried you're going out of business. You think about your own life. Man, that kind of anxiety cuts across everything. So the transformation process isn't just about programs and living liturgy and all, you know, everything. It's about the kind of climate and the sort of culture of a parish, and that was really important to deal with. And 
some of what I was trying to do was I wanted to establish a culture of listening in order to act in the parish. This is how we would do it. Our leaders, our best read me as rector, we still had our roles, but we wanted to just kind of cast it out there and let people talk and imagine and engage and assess. And of course, uh, getting started was having organic uh, conversations with current members and visitors because my second Sunday, we started to grow. I don't know why. Maybe people just thought, well, let's go see if the new, I was the first woman director, of course. Like, let's go see, you know, if a woman can do Anglo Catholic. <laughs> well, we'll see. I don't know. Organic, just kind of like, so how, how did you, what was it like for you, Mr. Visitor? Stop, stand up. So, like, well, so, I don't think I know your name. Uh, Scott. Scott, so how, how was it that you came to us this morning, or what? How did you hear about us? I was invited by a neighbor. Invited by a neighbor, and so, like, how did it go for you? What, what, is, what was it like? Well, I had a little trouble with the bulletin and, and the different books. <laughs> <laughs> the bulletin you wanted me to go to the book and I was running. By the time I got to that page, then you were asking me to kneel. Yeah. And then I, was there, I had to yeah. get back up again. Yeah. So, so some practitioners said that you had to come back to a place three times before you could make up an opinion. So this whole thing of listening and, and you know, this is leaders organically kind of putting things together in their heads as they listen broadly with current members about things, assessing things. And I'm talking about really assessing, like on a scale of one to five, everybody, how do you feel about Sunday morning worship? They go to market. And then let's talk about why you put your mark where you put it. So it's not brain surgery, but it is engagement. And the same about our daily office, the same about, about everything. And they said, Wow, no one's ever let us talk about this before, of course. So time then noticing, that is listening to me, what, where was I engaged and excited, where was I perplexed, where was I demoralized. And then based on these listening processes, we created two teams, a membership growth task force. <laughs> they were terrified using Anglo-Catholic for our identity. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and call ourselves this. Though it may kill us. But you have to understand, in Seattle, no one's ever heard of Anglo-Catholic, much less Episcopal. Yeah. They had no idea what that language was. It was all new to visitors. And then a liturgy, both a coordination group and a consultation group, because I had a lot of priest associates who had opinions. Uh, a lot of clergy went there, and so I wanted to have a container for those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. I wanted to listen to them. But when you do it as a consultation group, it has a whole different balance. It's yes. fabulous. Oh, my God. So this is some actual data collected, kind of rounded up. So this is, again, I talked, how many have ever heard of the size model? Congregational size month. It's really kind of old. But I tell you, it's fabulous. So I taught the size model. Mostly it's about dynamics change based on size. And all sizes are good. It's not like we're all, you know, being huge is that great a thing. It's about different ways that we do the transformation process based on size. And different dynamics we have to pay attention to, particularly as we grow up. So very small is average Sunday attendance under 50. Small is 40 to, and there's overlap, 40 to 100. Medium size is 75 to 200. Moderately large is, in this model is 150 to 400. Very large is 350 plus, because it's not all. Anyway, so I put up our average, so I said ours is 89. They didn't know it. Pulled it out of the books. The parochial report. And then I said, just come up and make a mark. How big do you want to be? It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> just as you imagine, if we want to grow, right? Or I didn't know really what they would do. Because some of them, and you can put that you want to be the same size we are or smaller. So they came up. 125, I'm sorry, 15 people. So it wasn't a huge meeting, but enough. Uh, 15 people put they wanted to get to 125. 
thought, wow, you know, we could probably afford what we want. We might be able to afford you if we, but then they decided, you know, we, actually we love it that you're part time. 25 people said, oh, no, let's stretch to 150. Then another 15 said, well, let's go for broke at 175. And one person put 225, and everybody laughed and thought he was crazy. And so what did I learn? Just by that. What did I learn? They wanted to do what? Whoa! They had said it in their profile, but often that doesn't match up with what people will actually say. Or, and who knew? You know, they didn't know what it meant, so once you get into it, you don't know what's going to happen. They don't want to draw anymore. Maybe. But I thought, phew, because that's what I want to be a part of. I'm, I'm really, this is what I found that I love to do. So I was relieved. So, just a bit of an aside here about Anglo Catholic identity. So, I do have to say this. So, this has to do with the realm we wanted, we chose to be in. And I think every parish has to decide where it kind of camps out under an Episcopal or slash Anglo, an Anglican identity. I believe our identity is healthy, is good, it certainly has its downsides. I'm in one of the colonies, you know. I, I understand the colonial thing quite well. You rebelled, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it makes a huge amount. Of, it's just crazy what, what that means. You know, I just had no idea. I thought, they are so cooperative. <laughs> um, but, uh, so ours was to camp out in Anglo-Catholic but one that had been through liturgical renewal. And it may be one of the few that is in that place. So these are just some of the kind of themes. Uh, the church as a divine creation, not as an accident, not as something that's kind of, hey, we can do with or without it, uh-uh. It's a place where we encounter God, that it was intentional. It wasn't just Luke making some things up in the book of Acts, you know. It was intentional. It's a place we encounter the living God through the sacraments. It's a place where we expect that in community we will work out our lives in fear and trembling. Reverence. Reverence for God, for nature, for each other, for the poor. Reverence expressed in the body by how we smell things by how we move, by what we touch, by how bodily we move in, the, in worship, reverence. The re-enchantment of everyday life, a sense of gratitude and joy, a sense that the communion of saints are real, that the saints actually, we affect them, they affect us. They're praying for us, we're praying for them. The dead as a continuing part of our community, future generations all a part of our community, God speaking through our lives. Beauty and justice together, beauty ex as expressing the dignity that God confers on every human being, and justice making as participating in God's dignifying action in the world. Somebody said God's idea of beauty is justice. Holiness of life is expressed in specific practices, and this is, oh man, this is gold. And really, Anglo-Catholic identity is Episcopal identity kicked up a notch, or it's like an intensification of Episcopal identity. That's how I think of it. So all this belongs to everybody in this room. Holiness of life in specific practices, rule of life, daily prayer, you know, participating, again, bodily in the Eucharist, quiet days, even when they're not quiet, uh, personal prayer, developing your own personal prayer practice. So these were the kinds of things that, that a bit gave us a guide to what we were doing. Next. So, so we were focusing on transformation, remember, and because the parish loved and had been affirmed so much by its worship and preaching, that's what was going to be a focus. Some would say, well, we already got it, it's pretty good, it's really great, just leave it. But it didn't shine like it needed. So here's something that the former rector had printed in the bulletin uh, at St. Paul's. 
If the ritual customs of the Episcopal Church are unfamiliar to you, relax and let the community carry you. When, I mean, when I went, <laughs> I wept. <laughs> and um, that became, other parishes started using it after a while. It wasn't really true for some of them, but the, the kind of, the, the waves of prayer and the way the music, it just, you didn't actually have to, <laughs> You know, you could put the books aside and just let it be there. This was particularly important to our evangelicals who didn't know they were going to be on the Canterbury Trail, but became on it when they, when they came to see us. So this is just stuff about what was going on in the parish. You know, we had two services. Music was a charism. The capacity was about 200. They did do daily morning, evening prayer and Eucharist. 80% time, me. <laughs> <laughs> this alone would could occupy all of your time. So getting priest associates into and figuring out what is the uh, worship schedule we can we can do. The full observance of the Triduum with the early morning uh, vigil, and then at the center of it, a palpable sense of prayer that would bring tears to your eyes. So strengthening it. So uh, again, we assessed everything, and we strengthened based on. The parish had started to do things like, in the summer, they can the incense. And my watchword was, we want to be our very best every Sunday. We want to be in full glory every Sunday. Because on any given Sunday, well, God's there, right? So are we, and who else might be there? Visitors. I wanted somebody to come and have their socks knocked off. That was my goal. And ours as well. And they knew they could do it. We strengthened beauty and mystery. We got rid of some things that some people associate with Anglo-Catholic parishes like genuflection because our folks couldn't do it well. It wasn't beautiful. Gone. Uh, <laughs> and then cleaning up. We just simplified. It was like, if any of you have been in monastery, it, it was more like that but in a huge space, big <coughs> gestures, not a bunch of little here and there, big gestures, big generous gestures, again, in the Northwest with mountains out the, uh, out the side. Then the other thing continued, so here was, uh, there was some talk, oh my God, the budget is so bad, let's cut the, uh, the section leaders in the choir, we had section leaders, over my reclining body, is what I said. <laughs> I will donate my money <laughs> to section because we, it was at the core of our identity and it made the difference of excellent music. And I'd say we went through a time when we were the best music in the city. Though some of the poor, we were poor, you know. Uh, trained servers and non liturgical, uh, not, I'm sorry, non anxious liturgical presence. We hadn't trained them. Uh, they were kind of just, you know, we had to do that. Strengthen preaching, and this nearly got me killed, to include saying goodbye to some preachers. <laughs> we had one preacher who actually was an ordained person, and uh, it was 20 minutes of scolding. And the first time I heard it, I thought, because mm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. again, think about Anglo Catholic identity. It's not about scolding, it really isn't the way I see it. So, uh, but that took some maneuvering on my part. Acquire and begin using a new font that got closer to full immersion. So they had the memory of a horse trough being brought in and full immersions. Their former rector was a, a member of Associated Parishes and had done all that work. They were a test site for the new prayer book when it was new. That the Episcopal Church filmed a mass at St. Paul, Seattle as, as to kind of publicize the new liturgy. And they had gone back to uh, the little historical font from really the early 1900s. And so I went to, a friend of mine and I went to a garden center, and for $129.50, with the full permission of the parish, we, we uh, got something we could do naked baby baptisms in. And we started doing them. <laughs> You'd think people wouldn't want to do that. They do. So a lot about liturgy, also strengthening gathering, this time of coming together. This was where the parish really had to do new work. 
newcomers gatherings, uh, new website with Anglo Catholic Identity front and center, new signage, positive word of mouth, and word of mouth starts with us internally saying, wow, that was an amazing sermon, or wow, that liturgy, uh, and the you know, we start that, we start that right at the center, uh, strengthening coffee hour, we did an entire training on how parishioners could talk to visitors. I know it sounds crazy, it changed the game, because they realized you don't have to sell, you have to ask questions. You ask questions, and then you kind of build on it. Uh, visitors contact information and follow up. Newcomers gather. <laughs> and keep going. Get yeah, keep going. Begin St. Paul's one-on-one -on -one each month. So this was after the liturgy. Anybody who wanted to, old-timers, newcomers, could come up and ask any question they want about what they just experienced. What do you think was the single most uh, asked question we got from newcomers? What would it be about in an Anglo Catholic parish? Why do you do that? <laughs> Why do you, it was about incense. So, it, one doesn't give a technical answer. One gives an answer that supports uh, the, the seeing of God and the experience of God. So, we got really good at that one. Uh, we revamped our formation. We began godly play and immediately started having children and initiating mutual discernment groups. Little groups where people could actually discern their own lives because we were doing it in the parish as a whole. And oh, by the way, <laughs> about the money and finances, thanking and saying goodbye to the treasurer, who in my interview kept, kept dropping the financials. We were in a restaurant, and they were everywhere. Uh, and I could see why. She was terrified. With a new tre treasure, create readable financial statements, focus on creating financial competence, strengthen the annual fund, and then show up in the bishop's office and renegotiate the assessment, which I did. And the warden did. And that was like a, something off our bag. So here's what it looked like over the time I was there. And I want you to know. I had no idea where this was going. I knew we were going to grow. I knew that I was wanted that task and I wanted to do it with them, but I did not know where it was going. 89, 125. I, I arrived February uh, of 2005 and on. And when I left, we were at 274. And they did continue to grow in the interim, which was very gratifying. So where did that growth come from? Evangelicals who'd given up on the church, who were right in our neighborhood, going to school in our neighborhood. Roman Catholics who, and they said this, just couldn't take it anymore. It was not the current pope, okay? It was another pope, and uh, they were just, uh, yeah, they came quite wounded. Uh, I, I was prepared to have them for a little while, because I think there's more than, it's a culture thing, right? offbeat couples or families with children who weren't looking for a suburban, even they, they might have lived out from the city, they wanted their kids to be exposed to the challenging neighborhood and the variety of interesting people we had in the parish, single men and women looking for community, LGBTQ and straight, academics, artists, and people working in healthcare who were overrepresented there, and then occasional attenders who came to us for their liturgy fix once a month, and some of them took two ferries to get there. People in the neighborhood and those driving over an hour to be with us. So really, once you get on the discernment and acting and learning, and act, we couldn't get off. I, I, there were times I thought, we've got to stop the madness. But it wasn't madness, or if it was, it was holy madness. So, Redeveloping a parish requires one intervention after another. So we just kept responding to what we heard. I kept doing things, wardens and teams kept doing things, and this is what emerged. Well, we went from two and began looking at three in 2009. I, in the listening process, I said, parish, you know, we can do this. Really, what you come up with, I will do. And my hope was they were going to say, a third Sunday morning, 
That's not what they said. They wanted to go to five, and suddenly there was all this energy coalescing around it, and the team was commissioned to do it. And in uh, 2009, we launched something we did call Sunday Evening at St. Paul's that was uh, still within our tradition, but different. So we went to the parish hall for flexible space, altar in the middle, because we're our, our church was kind of facing forward, movable chairs, choir stop, a shared homily where the comments are where people can talk back in kind of a 12-step style, expansive language and times of stuck stillness and silence, jazz musician, both for the hymns and then for honest to God jazz. A simplified ceremonial, we still used incense, gesture, investments, and described it as Benedictine. And I uh, got a, a community developer to work with me, and that was somebody who wasn't paid a lot of money to help, and seasonal artists in residence. The next is just a little something we created that it kind of announced it. And if you look close, you probably can't see it. This is how we talked about it beauty and mystery, silence and stillness open hearts and open minds, sacred conversation, the holy meal, and ancient ritual. Anyway, that, that happened. Redeveloping a parish requires one intervention after another. You're going to get sick of this next. I never wanted to do a building renovation in my life. I didn't want to do it. I had no plan in doing that because I heard you know, that rectors leave after doing that kind of stuff. Didn't want to do it. But I was asked by Seattle University to come be like a workshop person. <laughs> at their workshop, Summer Institute on Sacred Space. And in it, I thought, look, what I'll do is I'll workshop our space. So I took slides, and, and, and the, work, the, uh, the institute had developed these kind of liturgical space principles, and I had people do assessment of our space. Well, we sent more participants. They got interested. We had about 9 to 11 participants come to that. And then they said, we should do this in our own place. So I mean, we replicated the same listening process, and we were off. The one deep pocket in the parish came and said, I want us to do this, and I will put significant money on the table. And I said, what do you mean by significant? Anyway, uh, so we, we went into renovation. Uh, it had some aims. One was a full immersion font. The other was just getting, you know, much more integrated aesthetic. Uh, it was not taking down walls. We had to move into the parish hall downstairs during the renovation, and we had to go from two Sunday liturgies to what? Three on account of the space. So we were suddenly at four Sunday liturgies. And when we returned to the space of Christmas Eve of 2011, we decided to retain our four liturgies. All righty then. So you get to see some pictures. So that's the altar. It's Patina Brett. This was a very famous, very famous Northwest artist who wanted our project. She knew the Deep Pockets guy. Family. She said, oh, I've never done that. I don't know. So that's a slab of organ walnut, and that's the kind of interesting table. That's the full immersion font that's in the entryway. It's patinaed brass with water flowing from one down into the other, and then let's, now we get that fun. Oh, naked baby. Another naked baby. Another naked baby. <laughs> we had adults too, so we did them all at the vigil, you know, except when we don't have a, lots of baptisms, and when adults went down, the water flowed out and towards the street, theologically and really. Redeveloping a parish, <laughs> so this is how it works, right? You get on the, and it's hard to get off. Responding to what emerged, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. <laughs> yeah, so let's do Latino, Latina. So about this time, Alfredo Ferragrino, who was at Seattle University, uh, came out uh, from Mexico. He had the idea that he wanted to start a new generation Latino uh, expression of the Episcopal Church. So I just happened to serve, I was on the diocesan staff as well, and I could, act, could make a case for him getting some grants, but then the National Church, thank you National Church, also gave him some grants. 
And so at 1 o'clock p.m., <laughs> right as I was, right after, uh, as I was being elected in Canada, uh, this new community started. And of course, the, uh, the real task for the rector now is blocking and tackling. <laughs> Helping the parish to understand it's still its role to extend itself. It's not about their renting space, forget that. We want to be a part of the generosity of God. So that's our frame of here, and I guess that's a selfie. So, change equals vision times dissatisfaction times first steps. That's what the parish needs was first steps. Can, with God's help, overcome the natural human resistance to change. Discernment flows from engaging, engaging the people of God in listening processes with the real intention, that that's the Holy Spirit working, and with the intention of acting based on what we learn. Nobody ever taught me the core purpose of a parish church. We need a model, and so let's create one and use it. And finally, redeveloping a parish requires one intervention after another. And finally, <laughs> this is actually before the renovation. So that's, you know when that is. That's when they turn the lights on at the Easter Vigil. And uh, all that front row are all the new, mostly evangelical Christians, who non denominational evangelical Christians, who discovered that a disciplined, mysterious, rooted in its heritage, place of a affirmation and joy and possibility could be their home. And of course, they could find your parishes too. That was, I, I love that group. That was one of my favorite groups to work with. And so all that front row are, are people who've never been in an Easter Vigil before and found it a, a source of life. Thank you for your attention.